You know I'm not a pulpit rabbi when I don't know how to turn the microphone on. Hello, welcome everybody. So happy to have you all here for this very special program, The Power of Words, a partnership with Temple Israel and The Well. I'm Rabbi Dan Horwitz. I'm the founding director of The Well. It's a privilege to be here to share this evening with all of you. Um, Aside from being a personal friend, uh, it's a privilege to be able to introduce to you our speaker this evening, Sarah Hurwitz. Sarah Hurwitz was a White House speechwriter from 2009 to 2017, serving as a senior speechwriter for President Barack Obama, and then as chief speechwriter for First Lady Michelle Obama. Sarah worked with Mrs. Obama to craft widely acclaimed addresses, including her 2016 Democratic National Convention speech and her political speeches during the 2016 campaign cycle, and traveled with the First Lady across America and to five continents. Sarah was previously a senior speechwriter on the Obama campaign, chief speechwriter for Hillary Clinton during her 2008 presidential campaign, deputy chief speechwriter on the presidential campaigns of General Wesley Clark and Senator John Kerry, and a speechwriter for Senator Tom Harkin. Prior to working on the Clinton and Obama campaigns, Sarah was an attorney at the Washington DC office of Wilmer Hale. She's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. And in her free time, if you can believe it, it exists, actually has staffed immersive Israel experiences for the Schusterman Foundation, has been noted by the Leishtag Foundation as a Shabbat maker, attends Jewish meditation conferences and experiential retreats, um, and is very much in touch with her Jewish and professional roots in that way. So it's really an honor and a privilege uh, to welcome Sarah Hurwitz to share some remarks with all of us. And after she speaks, we'll have the opportunity uh, to run around and I'll be playing some Phil Donahue along with Tracy Feynman to pass microphone to those who might have questions. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Hurwitz. Thank you so much, Dan, for that incredible introduction. It is such a pleasure and such an honor to be here tonight. I really want to thank you all for having me. Uh, I actually grew up in a town where the entire population was 12,000 people, so to speak at a synagogue with over 12,000 members is kind of mind-blowing for me. Um, and I know that a shul doesn't attract this kind of membership unless they're doing something really special. So you all should be incredibly proud of the community that you've created here. And you know, I'm really incredibly proud to be here tonight to talk with you about some of my experiences in politics, to share some of the lessons that I've learned about speech writing, and to speak about how my Judaism has informed my political career. Now, I have to be honest, it always baffles me when people try to present their career as this linear series of well thought out steps, each achieving yet another milestone in their meticulously plotted out long term plan. I seriously have no idea what they're talking about. I have never had a long term plan and I often have not had a short term plan either. And that's honestly the reality of a career in politics. Whether you have a job in a week can depend on whether it rains on election day, or whether a foreign government hacks your emails, hypothetically speaking, or whether you, know, you happen to know someone who knows someone who calls someone and puts in a good word. And I think my own political career is a good example of this. You know, I got my start in politics by interning in the White House in the summer of 1998, and I was placed in Vice President Gore's scheduling and advance office, where I spent my time making rental car reservations and listening to my fellow intern, a guy named Len, talk about his sex life in vivid detail. <laughs> yes, and this was entertaining, but not really what I had in mind for my summer in the White House. And then one day, I actually crashed a going away party for one of Vice President Gore's staffers. And there, I met a guy who happened to be one of Gore's speechwriters. And desperate to escape the long calls with Hertz and the semi-pornographic conversations with Len, I basically begged this guy to let me be his intern. He agreed, and I had a wonderful summer working for him and his colleagues. And they actually helped me get my first job after college, which was in state government in Maryland. Now, in that job, I commuted three hours a day round trip. I sat in a windowless cubicle next to the bathroom, and I was completely miserable. I lasted nine months. 
I then got a job as a speechwriter for a wonderful US senator from Iowa named Tom Harkin, in which I quickly realized that I knew absolutely nothing about speechwriting. And I did my best to fudge my way through it, but in my first performance review, Harkin's chief of staff said to me, so Sarah, I hear you're thinking about law school. You should definitely do that. You know, really soon. Like ideally this year would be, would be great. So I took the hint and I headed off to Harvard Law School, vowing that I would never ever again write speeches since I clearly had no talent for it. And then in my third year of law of class, sorry, my third week of class, I met one of my classmates, a guy named Josh, who had previously been a speechwriter for President Clinton. And he convinced me to join him in just doing some freelance speech writing. And over the next couple of years, as we worked together, Josh taught me how you actually write a speech, how you structure it, how you write to be heard rather than to be read, which are two very different skill sets. And then one day in September of our third year of law school, Josh calls me to tell me that he has a new client for us. It was a Democratic primary candidate named General Wesley Clark. And it wasn't just a freelance job. It was more like a kind of a full-time campaign job. Now, this campaign was in Little Rock, Arkansas, and our law school was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Those two places are not close to each other. And up until this point, I had never skipped a class in my life. So I told Josh that he was insane, and that while I would come to Arkansas for like a couple days to help out, there was no way I was doing this full time. Well, a couple days turned into a couple of weeks, which actually turned into an entire semester of back and forth between Little Rock and Cambridge, and there was a lot more forth than back, and unfortunately, Clark lost. And then, after we finished law school, Josh got a job on Senator Kerry's presidential campaign, and he brought me with him, and as you all know, Senator Kerry lost. <laughs> yeah, I, I then decided that it was probably time to execute on my plan to be a lawyer, and I worked at a wonderful law firm in DC with people I absolutely adored. But I have to tell you that after 4,000 billable hours spent deep, deep in the weeds of large companies' legal problems, it was very clear to me that the law was not my calling. And fortunately, that was right about the time when I got a call from none other than my old friend Josh, who told me, Hillary Clinton is running for president, and she's looking for a chief speechwriter, and you should apply. To which I replied, are you kidding? There is no way I'm qualified for that job. Which is funny, because I had actually already been deputy chief speechwriter on not one, but two presidential campaigns. Still, I didn't feel qualified. Ladies here might recognize this, uh, this tendency. Um, a month later, Josh called again, and he told me they were still looking. And again, I actually said no. Like, who was I to write for this amazing woman who had been my hero since I was a kid? Finally, a month after that, Josh called again and said, OK, I think they might be cool with the idea of co-chief speechwriters. You could do the job with someone else. How about that? Now that sounded reasonable. So I applied, I interviewed, and Josh then called me to tell me that I had gotten the job, but they only wanted one chief speechwriter. <laughs> yeah. So by then it was too late to back out. So I took the job, which I held for 17 months until, of course, she lost. You'll notice a pattern here. I think people start to get worried when I show up for campaigns. Um, but a few days after Hillary's concession speech, I got a call from a guy named John Favreau, with whom I'd worked on the Kerry campaign, and some of you might recognize him as one of the hosts of Pod Save America, which is an excellent, excellent, pod, uh, excellent podcast about politics. I recommend subscribing. And so he was then Senator Obama's chief speechwriter, and after congratulating me on this hard-fought race, he gingerly asked whether I might be willing to come work for him as a speechwriter for Obama. I said yes. Happily. You know, while I loved Hillary and I was really proud to have worked for her, I also deeply admired and respected Senator Obama. So I headed to Chicago, started writing for him, and a few weeks into this new gig, John takes me aside and says, so we kind of need someone to write Michelle's Democratic convention speech, and people kind of want it to be you. And it seems crazy to remember this now, but I was pretty annoyed. You know, I was there to write for the candidate, not his wife, and I let John know that in no uncertain terms. And John was very sympathetic, but totally unmoved. And, you know, 
thank goodness for that. Because in the course of working on that speech, I came to know this brilliant, wise, funny, caring, inspiring woman, you know, someone who eventually became my speechwriting soulmate. Someone who, even though I had just spent 17 months attacking her husband on a rival campaign, <laughs> welcomed me like an old friend, as, by the way, did her husband himself, which I think tells you a lot about the kind of people the Obamas are. Anyway, Barack Obama won that election, which was obviously a very new experience for me to actually win. Um, and I had the pleasure of going to the White House with him, where I wrote speeches for him and then became chief speech writer for Mrs. Obama. And I have to tell you, this was an awesome job. You know, week after week, I got to sit down with Mrs. Obama and ask her, what do you want to say in this speech? And then I would just sit back and take notes on my laptop as she laid out brilliant, edgy ideas and literally full paragraphs of moving, vivid, beautiful language. I say, people often ask me, you know, what was it like to put words in Michelle Obama's mouth? And that just makes me laugh because it was, it was the exact opposite. You know, Michelle Obama knows who she is, she always knows what she wants to say, and my biggest asset as her speechwriter was my ability to type quickly. And so for eight years, I got to travel with her and with President Obama across the country and around the world in this big blue and white plane stamped United States of America. We were riding in motorcades on five continents where we would just see people lining the streets, waving American flags, so excited to see an American president or first lady. And I got to meet extraordinary people. You know, I met kids who grew up surrounded by gangs and drugs, but still somehow managed to get themselves to college. I met veterans and military families who make the most extraordinary sacrifices for our country. I met girls across the globe who would literally walk for hours each day just to get to school, and then they would walk hours back and study for hours more each night by candlelight. And I got to help Mrs. Obama write a historic speech at the 2016 Democratic National Convention, and surprisingly, the Republican one as well. And, you know, <laughs> I also, I also got to work on the speech in October where she spoke so passionately about the misogyny that we were seeing in this past election. And I'll tell you, in the weeks after that speech, which she gave in New Hampshire, I got to read some of the letters that she got. She got letters from women of all ages saying things like, you made me realize that I no longer need to be ashamed. And she got plenty of letters from men saying, Thank you for giving voice to the disgust that so many decent guys are feeling right now. Now, was this job stressful and exhausting? It was. Uh, when you know that every word you write is going to be scrutinized by people across the globe, that can occasionally keep you up at night. Um, and were there some near misses? There were. I'm actually still haunted by a speech that Mrs. Obama gave in Japan. <clears throat> She was announcing a new partnership with the Japanese government to promote girls' education in developing countries. And so I wanted to find a really nice Japanese proverb to end her speech. And after days of searching, I finally found one that went as follows. No road is long with a good companion. This is perfect, okay? The challenge of educating girls would be hard, but it would be doable with our wonderful companion, the government of Japan. And I thought, like, I am so good at this. So I sent it to the staff at our embassy in Japan, just as an FYI, and a few hours later, I get a call from one of the local staff. She's a Japanese woman who was employed by our embassy to help with translation. And she says to me, Sarah, so I know this sounds like it's a really nice proverb about friendship, but actually, it's a proverb about suicide. I did not know this. Uh, she launched into this very long, complicated explanation, which I didn't even listen to because I was so shocked and just busy deleting it from the speech. Um, but I was once again reminded of the importance of fact checking. Uh, you don't know what you don't know. And so it's always important to just show speeches to a lot of, pe a lot of people. You never know what they're going to catch. And actually, I also learned a number of other important lessons about speech writing. And I actually, I'd like to share a few, with them, few of them with you tonight because I think these tips about speech writing are as useful for giving a big speech to thousands of people as they are for speaking at a meeting at work or even speaking at the dinner table with your family. Mm. So the first one, number, tip number one, say something true. 
this seems abundantly obvious. Um, <laughs> But that's generally actually not where people start when they're planning to speak. Often when people are planning to speak, they ask themselves, okay, what will make me sound smart or powerful or funny? Or they ask themselves, what does my audience want to hear? Those are fine questions, but they shouldn't be your first question and they are not your most foundational question. Your first most foundational question should be, what is the deepest, most important truth I can tell at this moment? Let me give you a couple of examples. In President Obama's 2004 convention speech, back when he was a senator, he started that speech by saying the following, tonight is a particular honor for me because let's face it, my presence on this stage is pretty unlikely. Now that is a fairly bold truth that he's starting his first speech on the national stage with. He was basically saying what, let's be honest, a lot of people in the audience were thinking. What, what is a black guy named Barack Hussein Obama doing here giving this keynote address? And he just walked right up there and he owned it. He said it. He said something that was glaringly true to a bunch of people in that room at that moment. And when you do that, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable, you gain credibility. People immediately trust you. I think Mrs. Obama actually did something similar in her 2016 convention speech, which she started, as you may remember, by telling a story about her daughter's first day of school in the White House. She talked about putting them into these big black cars with these men with guns and seeing their little faces pressed up against the window. And she asked herself, like, what have we done? I mean, she was actually sharing with America that she was afraid that she was gonna mess her daughters up for life by having them live in the White House. This is a deep truth. This is a very honest, personal moment. And I think that it really draw, drew people towards her. It made people trust her. So say something true. <clears throat> Number two, talk like a person. Again, it just seems so obvious, but this is not what people do. People often get up behind a podium or they chair a meeting and they kind of lose their minds. Um, you know, in the business world, they'll start doing this weird jargony stuff of, you know, we'd like to catalyze the transformational results oriented change to unsilo our verticals. And it's like, no one knows what they're saying. Uh, in politics, what you get is a lot of kind of soundbitey, slogany language. So you get, we need to put hardworking American middle class family values first. I don't know what that means. Um, you know, what people do is they don't talk like themselves, but they talk like how they think a speaker should talk. And the truth is, it sounds fake. You know, you would never turn to your spouse, your friend, your colleague and say like, you know, honey, we really need to put hardworking American middle class family values first. And frankly, if you wouldn't say something to one person, don't say it to many people. It does not get better. Um, people will just tune you out. They won't trust you. So talk like a person. Talk like you normally do. Tip number three is show, don't tell. This is about images versus adjectives and the importance of detail. So I'm gonna tell you the story of my friend John in two versions. The story of my friend John, version one. My friend John is so obsessive. He's just so exacting and neurotic, very precise, very compulsive. <clears throat> Adjectives. My friend John, version two. I left my friend John alone in my kitchen for 10 minutes. When I came back, he'd organized all the spices in my spice rack in alphabetical order, and he was busily lining up the magnets on my refrigerator to make them perfectly centered. <laughs> That's an image. Which are you gonna remember? the five adjectives that I listed off for you or the actual concrete image of my friend John. You're gonna remember the image. I think a real life example of, I don't have a friend named John, that's a fake example, but a real life example is a speech that Mrs. Obama gave at Dr. Maya Angelou's funeral a few years ago. And she was talking about how when she was a girl, there were very few images of black women in magazines or on TV, and she had very few African American female role models. She could have gone on and on and said, that hurt my self-esteem, that was hard for me, it made me feel invisible, made me sad. But instead, what she said was this. As a child, <clears throat> my first doll was Malibu Barbie. Now that, that's an image, right? You can see in your mind this image of a young African-American girl playing with this horrible blonde doll that looks nothing like her, and what is that saying to her? What kind of message is she getting? You really feel that story in a way that you wouldn't if you should just listed off a bunch of adjectives. So show, don't tell. <clears throat> Tip number four, 
The fourth and final tip actually comes from David Axelrod. Some of you may know he is the great political strategist behind Obama's 2008 and 2012 victories, and he was a senior advisor in the White House where he would often meet with the speechwriting team. And you know, one day, one of my colleagues was struggling with a speech, and Axelrod just looks at him and says, Adam, you just need to write a love letter to America which is like really annoying advice to receive if you're a speechwriter struggling with a speech. Like, what does that mean? But it's actually really wise. I think what Axelrod was saying is that your passion about what you're talking about, it really needs to come through. That is what's gonna move and persuade people. You know, if you don't love and care about the topic you're writing about or the audience you're writing for, it is really hard to write a good speech. So I spent a lot of time getting to know the audience that I was writing for. I talked to military families. I talked to women whose husbands were on their third and fourth deployment. I talked to military kids who moved schools every two years as their families got moved around the country and around the world. I got to know them. When Mrs. Obama gave a speech for school guidance counselors, I talked to actual school counselors. And I asked them, what are the challenges you face? What's it like being a school counselor today? When Mrs. Obama did commencements, I would talk to students, to administrators, to faculty. I mean, I, there was one particular speech I remember that was at the Santa Fe Indian School, which is a tribal high school out in New Mexico, and it is this outstanding school where kids from all kinds of reservations in the area who are facing a lot of struggles in their lives, they come to this school, they get a great education, and they all go to college. And so I spent a lot of time talking to folks at this school, and <clears throat> one of the teachers actually told me about the challenge of getting these kids to integrate their ancient customs and prayers into their modern day lives. And he said to me, you can't imagine what it's like to see a kid saying a 2,000 year old blessing over his hydroponically grown plants. And I said like, actually, I can. You know, as a Jew, we, we do quite a bit of that ourselves. So, you know, I was really moved by their stories. And I think that's one of the things that defines a good speechwriter. I think it's the ability to be moved by other people's stories. You know, that's really what allows you to tell these stories in a moving way. <clears throat> and I think that my ability to do that actually has a lot to do with my Judaism. <clears throat> I really, frankly, can't think of a better encapsulation of the fundamental moral orientation of Judaism than the phrase we all know that is repeated so many times in the Torah the instruction to love the stranger, to welcome the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You know, I think we're being told repeatedly and in no uncertain terms that it is our job to identify with those on the margins, those who are vulnerable, those who are not part of the in-group, the kin group, to remember that always that they too are created in the divine image. And I think that's actually the key point and the overall impact of the stories of the matriarchs and the patriarchs in Genesis. You know, we see them wandering through lands that aren't theirs, inhabited by groups they are not members of, and we get a real sense of their fear and their vulnerability. You know, for example, during their travels, Abraham and his wife Sarah lie to people. They tell people that Sarah is Abraham's sister. Why do they do this? They do this because they know that if a man from one of the other groups takes a liking to Sarah, and wants her as a wife, that man may well kill Abraham to make that possible. But if the man thinks Sarah is just Abraham's sister, he'll be safe. And by the way, Isaac and Rebecca tell the same lie in their travels. Another example is when Joseph is sold into slavery in the house of a man named Potiphar. If he rises to the top of the household, he is running all of Potiphar's affairs. He is Potiphar's closest confidant. But the minute Potiphar's wife accuses Joseph of rape, He's nothing but this lowly Israelite slave, and he's immediately sent to jail. And I think these stories are trying to instill in us a really visceral sense of what it's like to always be on borrowed time, to, to always be at the mercy of others. And obviously, this storyline only intensifies when the Israelites are actually enslaved in Egypt. And I think the point of the revelation at Sinai seems to be telling us to create a society that is the exact opposite of Egypt, create a just society. You know, one that's not focused on military might or material wealth, one that doesn't exploit those who are weak, but actually does just the opposite, showing special care and concern for those who are really vulnerable. And I think Rabbi Daniela Hartman has a beautiful way of expressing this idea that I think is at the very heart of the Jewish project. He calls it the ethic of non-indifference. 
the belief that we can never let ourselves be indifferent to the suffering of others. You know, I thought a lot about all this during my time in the White House. In fact, I'll never forget an analysis that the White House Digital Strategy Office did of presidential correspondence. They actually went through and analyzed all of the emails that President Obama received during a particular time period. And they created a word cloud, a visual representation of the most frequently used words in these emails. Words that were used more frequently were represented in bigger font, and words that were used less frequently were in smaller font. And in this word cloud, the word in the biggest font was not jobs, or taxes, or economy, or healthcare. No, the biggest word, the most frequently used word in emails people were writing to the President of the United States was help. People were writing to the President and they were asking for help. Help to pay their bills, help to see the doctor, help to afford college for their kids. And that's what I felt like we were doing in the Obama administration. We were trying to help people. We are trying to help people who were doing everything right but still having a really hard time. We were trying to help people who were often incredibly vulnerable. And more than anything else, I felt like it was my job as a speechwriter to tell those stories. Stories of those Native American teenagers at that tribal high school. Stories of those military families who were waiting for that knock at that door. Stories of kids whose parents are immigrants who are terrified that their families are going to be torn apart. You know, these are the stories of today's strangers. And they're stories that too often go untold. And telling them takes compassion. Axelrod was right. Telling these stories takes love. And I know it can seem like things like compassion and love are kind of in short supply today. I know that too often today, the loudest voices in our national conversation are voices of hate and fear and anger and blame. These voices are being amplified at the very highest levels and these voices are the ones that too often get the clicks and they get the airtime. But my time at the White House showed me that there are plenty of other voices out there. There are voices of decency and compassion and generosity and caring. And the thing is, these voices are quiet. They don't shout. They don't insult people on Twitter. And I'm thinking in particular of the various emails that people sent to the president in response to the Syrian refugee crisis. Many people wrote in to the president actually offering to take in refugee families themselves. One woman wrote, money is tight for us in my household, student loans, car payments, medical bills, but I have a guest room. I have a pantry full of food. We can do this. Another woman who is a single mother of three adopted children wrote, our voices may be lost in the shouting, but we are here. I would gladly open my home to a family in need, neighbor, immigrant, refugee. I'm also thinking about a man who sent a letter to the president to thank him for his work to rescue the economy and create jobs. This man wrote, a few years ago, I didn't have a job and my whole family was scrambling to make ends meet. I prayed daily that something would happen positive for this young man on the brink of a nervous breakdown. I was at home watching television and my phone rang. I was sure it was a bill collector. Turns out, it was a hotel in need of a dishwasher. I was so happy. I got the job and I have been there for two years now. And now, instead of visiting the food closet at our local church, me and my family can donate three or four cans a week so someone else experiencing hard times can eat. These folks are not indifferent to others, even when they're just barely getting by themselves, even when it would be totally understandable to just focus on their own problems and their own lives and their own needs. And I think that is a very Jewish way to walk in the world. I think that is very much still our mission as a people. And that's really what I and my colleagues in the Obama White House were trying to do these last eight years. We were trying to help build that just society, a society that honors the inherent dignity and humanity in every person, and that really takes special care of the least among us. And I am incredibly proud of the work that we did. I'm incredibly grateful that I got to be part of it. And with that, I would be very happy to just open this up to any questions you might have for me, and we can kind of make this more of a conversation. So thanks so much. Thank you, Sarah. Wow.
Thank you, Sarah. Hi. Um, I'm over here on this half. Tracy's going to be on the other half. If you have a question you'd like to ask of Sarah, we'll invite you to raise your hand. We'll pass the mic. We'll ask you to stand up as you ask, and then pass the mic back as Sarah answers. So what are you doing now? <laughs> So I just spin class the other day, I watched some Netflix, really into Black Mirror, great show. Um, no, seriously, I, so I've spent the last few months as a fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard University, which is a wonderful fellowship for kind of people in the midst of transitions in their political careers. You go, you hang out with students, it's really a delight. And what I'm actually doing now is I'm working on a book proposal for a book I'd like to write actually about Judaism. Normal next step from leaving eight years in the White House, it's like what everyone does, <laughs> the huge. Um, I really want to write something for Jews like me, who I think, like may maybe many of you, like many of the Jews I know, grew up with the typical kind of bad Hebrew school, boring services. You were kind of out after that. And I think having returned to it as an adult over the last few years and just seeing just the extraordinary wisdom in this tradition, the incredible you know, offerings of modern Jewish theology, of Jewish ethics, I think there is so much here that the average Jew knows nothing about that I certainly knew nothing about. So I kind of want to write a book for Jews like me saying, I get it, like I, I get all your hangups, I shared them, but there's a lot here for you. And I'm hoping to inspire people to pursue it more deeply and to kind of study on their own. So I have to get a book deal, so that's the one limiting factor. But if, if that can happen, that's what I want to focus on. And if not, I need a, a plan B. Sarah? Yes, I'm right here we here. go. Okay. What, what was the most difficult situation you were involved in as a Jew, like a controversial mm. thing in the Obama administration when your Judaism really spoke to you and how you dealt with it? What a great question. Um, you know, I think my Judaism certainly, it certainly just informed my passion about telling these. I, I think I was, you, if you look at the commencement speeches Mrs. Obama did, she never spoke at Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. She spoke at historically black colleges and universities, at a tribal high school, at the City College of New York, which is a school of immigrants. And that was where her heart was, and that's where my heart was. So that was a very good mix, was a very good meshing. It's actually funny, my, um, my last year in the White House in October, uh, Mrs. Obama was giving her speech in Manchester, New Hampshire, where she was going to be talking about the sexual assault tape with Donald Trump on it. And that speech was literally the day after Yom Kippur. And so, you know, Yom Kippur is the day before the speech, and you know, typically the day before a speech, last minute things come up, you, you need to deal with it. And you know, I told my colleagues a, a week ago, listen guys, I'm gonna be offline entirely that day, we'll lock the speech down in advance, that'll be fine. And that was, and then the, the tape broke, and then it was like, suddenly the speech you know, took on a bigger residence and we're sort of working on it, and I really began to think to myself, can I really be offline for 24 hours for Yom Kippur? And the answer I kind of knew was no. I mean, my colleagues would have covered for me. Everyone would have totally understood and been very supportive. In fact, I think they would have been upset if they thought that I wasn't, you know, honoring my tradition and, and going. But I just, I thought about it a lot. And I talked to a lot of my friends who are rabbis. And I just thought to myself, you know, Michelle Obama has this shofar-like voice that has an ability to really cut through and really speak deep truths. And I just thought, you know, if I'm part of a tradition that doesn't allow me in this incredibly important moment where something really important needs to be said to step away for a few hours to tend to this speech, then, then this isn't the right tradition for me. And you know, talking to my friends who are rabbis, they were like, Sarah, don't worry about this. Like, you, you know, you need to do what you need to do in this moment. So I, you know, there's this like long string of emails of me being like, I'll be offline for 24 hours. Then a couple days later, it's like, okay guys, I'll be offline from like six to nine and then like nine to 12. And then finally it was like, okay guys, I'll be offline from nine to 11, then I'll check email. Like, and so I did end up checking email at 11 in the morning on the day of Yom Kippur. And indeed there were an inbox full of emails about the speech and I kind of waved goodbye to my friend, the rabbi and went into work and I was still fasting. And it was, you know, it was, it was a balance that I had to make. And I think this is the challenge of Judaism is, you know, for me, it's doing it seriously, but also understanding what it means for me and what it means in the world. And it was balancing those two things. And I think these are decisions that all of us kind of make in our lives as modern liberal Jews. Like this is, this is a challenge. Were I orthodox, would have been easy. I'm off, sorry, figure it out, but I'm not. So I think that balancing act was challenging in that moment. 
Um, what was the toughest speech that you had to write in terms of like the issue that you had to speak or write about for the, one of the Obamas? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, people often ask me, what do you do when you disagree with the person for whom you write? And the answer is, I don't, ever. You know, I only write for people with whom I, dis I agree. So I've never had a, an instance where, you know, we just had a real disagreement of a policy or a principle in a speech that's just never been an issue. Um, but I think a speech that was, it was very challenging writing Mrs. Obama's Democratic National Convention speech this year because she had such a clear vision of what she wanted to say. She so clearly laid it out for me. And for some reason, I was just really struggling to execute what she wanted. Like, I just couldn't quite pull it together. And it was kind of, you know, she was so clear on what she wanted, and I just was so struggling to deliver it. And I remember actually being at this retreat that I was helping. It was a retreat for young Jewish professionals that I was helping teach at with my friend who's a rabbi. And I, like, taught this session on Shabbat. And I was like, it's so great to take time off on Shabbat, blah, blah. And then I, like, went back to my room and just stayed up all night working on this speech on Friday night on Shabbat. Another, you know, one of those moments. Um, it was just a real struggle, but eventually it came together. And I think that's the challenge of speech writing is it's sort of like the, you know, you have to just trust that the muses are going to come. You have to just trust that at some point it's going to come together. And there are a lot of moments where you're just like at sea, right? You have writer's block, you can't get it together, it's three in the morning, you're really tired. And, you know, we're not novelists. Like, there's a deadline for these speeches and it's generally very soon. So I think when you get caught up in those moments, like you can't wallow, it's like you gotta call a friend, you have to take a walk, you have to read something that inspires you, you just can't let yourself get stuck. And as a result, speech writers are very good trained writers. You know, we learn to write quickly, we learn to get over our writer's block very quickly. So I think, you know, that speech was just, for some reason it was really challenging. You know, eventually things did come together, but it's a harrowing moment before they do. I was wondering if you were present at one of the Passover seders that were in the White House. There were eight, I believe, while he yes. was president, and then a ninth mm -hmm. in the primary uh, time before yep. he was actually in office, so there were nine. Were you present at any of those? I was not. Those seders were actually for the people in the original seder. You know, the, the way that seder started is they were all on the road. And a couple of Jewish staffers, you know, they were in some hotel, who knows where on the road, and it was Passover. And so a couple of the Jewish staffers said, like, we're going to have a Seder. We're going to do this. And then other staffers said, well, can I, can I come? And so one staffer was an African-American, was like part of it. And she was like, wait a second, my ancestors were slaves. Like, this is interesting. And then another staffer had a story. And so all these staffers kind of came together, Jewish and non-Jewish. I think Obama might have been there, too. And they had this Seder in, like, a hotel in, you know, somewhere. And they, they said, if we get to the White House, like next year in the White House, we'll do it there. <laughs> and so, so they actually started doing it in the White House. So the people who went to that Seder were generally the people from that original Seder. So I never got to go, unfortunately. Would have been fun. I did go to the Hanukkah party, which is very cool, but not the Seder. Hi. Hi. Um, they say flattery is the sincerest form of, you know, of imitation, or imitation <laughs> is the sincerest form of flattery. And um, what is your opinion of what Melania Trump did? <laughs> it's funny. I'm, I'm yet to go somewhere where I don't get this question, so <laughs> thanks for asking it. Um, you know, the truth is, like, that is every speechwriter's worst nightmare, right, for something like that to happen. And I think my reaction was sort of a, like, there but for the grace of God go I, and also just a feeling of just overwhelming gratitude that in the Obama White House and on the Obama campaigns, we had the most rigorous fact-checking operation you have ever seen. And these people were merciless, and they literally reviewed every word of every line of every speech I ever wrote. And their standard of truth was kind of ridiculous, to be honest, but also really kind of edifying, really helpful for me, because you know, I might, Mrs. Obama might start a speech by saying, oh, I see my friend, Mayor so-and-so here tonight. You know, she's doing such a great job here in this city. And our fact checkers would look at that line and they'd write me an email saying, Sarah, is Mrs. Obama really friends with this person or are they just acquaintances? What is the nature of their relationship? How many times have they, I mean, literally. And then it would be, well, Mrs. Obama said she's doing a great job, but I just read an article where someone was criticizing the mayor about a decision she made. So maybe you should change great to good or, you know, that was the level of fact checking that my speeches went under. So I have to tell you, it's very hard to make a catastrophic mistake when you have that kind of support. 
And I think when you don't, it's, it's easier to do so. So, you know, that was my, my feeling about that. Um, listening to you with your experience, I think you can run for vice president and <laughs> I'll vote for you. Can you say something about the procedure when, before you write a speech? Do yes. they tell you what to write? Do they uh, cut it off, adding something? And the last one, uh, after you hear their, they give the speech, mm -hmm. don't you feel funny? That's my speech. How can, <laughs> how can they talk like, like they're, it's theirs? So let me answer your last part first. Um, I get asked this a lot, like, does it annoy you that they take credit for your speech? And my answer is, it's never my speech. You know, with the Obamas, they know what they want to say. So it's so much their words, their ideas, their themes. And sure, you know, some of my skill, maybe some of my ideas are part of it, but it's not mine. So I never feel like, oh, she's getting credit for my work. I feel like that's her speech by the end. And you'll see that, you know, with our process, our process starts, might, would always start with Mrs. Obama telling me exactly what she wanted to say. And then I would take that and I would weave it together into a draft. And then, you know, I might do some of my own research, just do some thinking on my own. And then I would send that draft around to my colleagues and they would look at it and make sure, okay, is it accurate? Are there, you know, could it be misinterpreted in any way? Are there any legal issues? Is the policy correct? And so they would kind of check it and then I would send it to her and then she would heavily edit it. You know, it was already her words, but she was sort of heavily line edited and line edited and we'd go back and forth over a period of days. And you know, by the end, it's really hers. So I don't feel like, oh, you know, it's, it's my words that she's using. That's, that's not how it feels. Um, I also think a lot of times people wonder, like, how do you get someone else's voice? It's a very strange thing that you do as a speechwriter, right? You're, not, you're writing in someone else's voice. And I think the question I would ask you is if I said to you, okay, I need you, I need you to write a speech in the voice of your spouse, your colleague, your best friend, someone you know really well, you could probably do it, right? You could probably imitate them. You have a sense of what they would say. That's kind of the case with the person you're writing for. You get to know them over a period of years. You get, you get so much feedback from them that you really begin to kind of hear their voice in your head. And so when I wrote for Mrs. Obama, I would hear her voice in my head. You know, I would hear her saying, okay, this transition's a little loose, or like, yeah, this part feels a little bit, you know, feels a little bit kind of too long, let's tighten that up. Like, I would actually hear her saying that as I wrote. So you kind of begin to self-edit after a while. So that's the process, and that's how the, the getting the voice works. So I guess to uh, <clears throat> piggyback off the last question there, mm -hmm. so what did that discourse look like between you and, and Michelle? Was it was it an open discourse? You're right flank. You know, you kind of painted the picture of she's, you know, divulging all these, you know, paragraph graph long, you know, ideas, and you're kind of frantically writing them down and trying to, you know, seam them together. You know, what did that look like? A little more in depth. I mean, it really, you know, it. it <laughs> I sort of trying to think of a way to bring more complexity to it, but it really was pretty simple. Like I really would sit down with her and just be like, what do you want to say? You know, sometimes I would write her a briefing memo the night before, giving her more information on the venue or whatever, but she usually came in with a pretty clear idea of what she wanted, and it really was about me kind of like typing it out and just getting it down. And sometimes I would ask her for more information. I'd say like, sometimes I'd want to know, like, how do you want to start this speech? Because it's hard to know how to start something. I would sometimes ask her, you know, okay, you're standing there before this audience, what are you thinking? And that was a good way to give, get a sense for like, how would she want to kind of kick this off? I think that was, that was helpful. Um, yeah, it really was very much a kind of back and forth conversation. It was a dialogue and the process of editing was very much a back and forth conversation of her making extensive edits, me implementing those edits. And sometimes I would offer, suggest, okay, here's some edits on your edits that you could consider and maybe she'd take them, maybe she wouldn't, but it was really a back and forth. But in the end, it was just really her words. You know, it was her ideas. It was just so much her. So that was that was why when I watched her speeches, I never felt like, oh, that's that's her, that's mine, and she's getting credit. It was the opposite. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so, were they interested in Judaism, either one of them? Do they ask you questions about it and want to know how you, how it, your Judaism affected your writing and how it helped? You know, it's funny. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't really start getting in. Sort of, you know, studying and learning about Judaism until probably the last few years of the White House. 
And it was not really something I brought up with them. You know, like I just, you, the, our interactions were really about work. You know, when we were, when you're in the White House and you're meeting, it's like there's limited time. You know, we, I only got a limited amount of time to talk to her about speeches. So I often felt like I was just trying to get as much out of her in those 20 minutes or 30 minutes or sometimes five or 10 minutes as possible. So I didn't often kind of talk a lot about personal stuff, but she definitely at the end, you know, when I told her what I was thinking about doing and wanting to write this book, she was incredibly supportive and just really excited for me that I was doing something that I was really passionate about. And definitely she and her staff were just very supportive of me kind of, you know, observing Judaism and, and getting into this. I mean, I, I remember when I started to try to observe Shabbat for some period, like I sent an email to my colleagues just explaining what it was and that I would be not checking email but available by phone. And it was amazing how my colleagues all responded like, this is great. You know, we're so happy that you're doing this. Like, what a, what a really meaningful thing to do. We're so proud of you. Like, this is really wonderful. So I, I felt like it was a really supportive atmosphere in general, but I didn't, you know, I didn't really take up a lot of time talking about personal stuff because work stuff was so intense. Hi. 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 <laughs> um, I am curious, uh, as you're reflecting back on the last eight years or so, how you're personally characterizing the impact that you've had on our country. And I'm wondering if that um, sense of pride or sense of whatever you might be feeling has changed based on the current election. Are you feeling deflated? Are you feeling hopeful? I'd love to just hear more about how you feel about what you were able to share with, with us. Yeah, I mean, you know, I really think like, when I think about back to 2008, I just think about how many people got involved in politics for the first time because of Barack Obama. I think about all these people who were lining up for hours around the block to vote, and people who like wouldn't leave. I mean, literally, lines for hours, and they just refused to leave because they wanted to vote. And these were people, a lot of whom had voted for, were voting for the first time. And I, I think people really got engaged in our national life in a pretty extraordinary way because of Barack Obama, and I think that he and Mrs. Obama were extraordinary role models for people. You know, I think that a lot of people looked at them and would like would tell their kids like, "This is what you should be." You know, you should work really hard. And you know, they didn't come from advantaged backgrounds. I mean, Mrs. Obama grew up in a working class family. Neither of her parents went to college. You know, President Obama was the son of a single mother, and yet they had risen up. You know, they're African Americans, they're minority in this country, and yet they had risen up to the greatest heights. And I think to tell kids, not just children of color, but all kids, like, there's nothing you can't do. Like, look at these people, they're incredible role models. So I, I think that had a really serious impact. I think the Obamas really set an incredible standard for what a president and first lady can be. And you know, thinking about what happened in this election, yeah, I find it disturbing, I find it troubling, I find it frightening. Um, but I don't think it undoes what we did in, in those eight years. And I don't think it reflects who we really are as a country. I think it's important to not lose sight of the fact that you know, Hillary Clinton did get three million more votes. Like, I think we're kind of, we often look at the election as if it were like 90%, 10%. Like, it wasn't, you know, it was actually not that. So I try not to get discouraged. Um, I think seeing the new wave of activism that is sweeping the country is just blowing my mind. You know, to see people who have no interest in politics, could care less, they're calling their Congress people. I mean, if you look at their listenership of Pod Save America, these are people who hate politics, have no interest, but they're they're listening to this podcast because they want to know more. They want to learn about politics. They want to get engaged. The number of people I'm seeing running for office, like young people from all different backgrounds. So I actually feel, you know, I have good days and bad days, but I, I have a lot of hope right now seeing the kind of activism that's sweeping this country. And I'm, I'm going to be really curious to see what happens in 2018 in the midterms. Hi. Um, what would you say is the biggest piece of advice you'd have for a kid who's maybe interested in pursuing a path similar to yours? That's a great question. Um, so I would say the most important thing you can do is intern. Intern. Be an intern. I can't tell you how important that is. And I know it's financially difficult because a lot of these internships are unpaid. But this is the kind of thing, like, if you're in college, you know, is, the, is there a mayor in the city where your college is? Is there, like, a local town councilman? Is there the president of your university? Do they need someone to work for them? I mean, there are so many sort of political internships that you can do because the truth is, you know, in Washington and in politics, no one looks at your resume and your 
transcript and says, oh, this person got straight A's, like, I'm going to hire them. That's not how it works. You hire someone when someone calls you and says, hey, this kid worked for me. She was amazing. She was the best intern I ever had. She worked so hard. She gets it. She's diligent. And I say, oh, great. I need someone good. That's honestly how it works. So I think getting that first internship will then lead you to your next one and your next one. It really is this kind of almost apprentice-based system. So I would just highly recommend interning, number one thing. Hi. I want to thank you for being Hi. here. I'm sorry for not standing. I have That's my totally elbow. fine. But uh, now that I have a microphone, <laughs> let's, change, let's change gears for just a moment. You had mentioned early on that you might be seriously considering writing a, uh, a book. And I was just wondering, with your experience, your incredible capability, and that Judaism is extremely important to you, and it is one of the certain more than building blocks of your life. Mm -hmm. Has the singer-songwriter Debbie Friedman been at all an inspiration to you? That is a question I've never gotten. Uh, <laughs> it's a good one. I actually really I love her music. Uh, I don't know a lot of it, but what I do know, I actually really, really love. I think it is. Um, it's funny you ask this question because actually I'm pretty picky about my services and I, I tend to really like Debbie Friedman style music and the more kind of modern uh, guitar based kind of uh, music and services. So it's actually, that's how I choose the Shabbat services that I attend. So I actually really, I love her music. I should probably listen to more of it now that I'm, now that you're asking about it, but uh, <laughs> not something I thought a lot about, but I'll, I'll look into it. I'll look into her. Okay, great. Thank you. Sarah, did you interact with Joe Biden and other people in the White House very much? And what, what did you see from them that helped you? You know, I didn't interact with the vice president really, except for occasionally passing him in the hallway. And he was, I remember one time I was walking by the Rose Garden and I saw him and his entourage of Secret Service coming. So I kind of flattened myself up against the wall to just let him pass. And he was like, hey, kid, what are you doing? You don't have to do that. Come on. Like, it's very, totally charming. Um, so lovely guy. But I will say about my colleagues, you know, I worked with the most extraordinary people I could ever dream of working with. I mean, these were people who were kind, who were decent, who were compassionate, who worked incredibly hard. Many of them had come from pretty difficult backgrounds themselves and were in politics to try to help people from, you know, who'd grown up like they had. It was just this really supportive, collegial, loving team. And I, you know, I, feel, I felt like I could pick up the phone anytime, day or night, call anyone in the White House, and they would immediately get back to me and just say, what do you need? How can I help you? I mean, the number of times, I just think about the number of times I emailed Josh Ernest, the White House press secretary. This guy is busy, but I would email him with a paragraph I was worried about, and I don't know, Josh, what do you think? Is this gonna be a problem? And he would just take the time to write these long emails back, with ideas, suggestions, reassurance. And he'd always write some encouraging note like, Sarah, you know, you're working so hard. Good job. We really appreciate you. I mean, that was the Obama White House. So, and I'll tell you to this day, my speechwriting colleagues and I, when we write pieces in our own voice, we send them to each other. Like, we still have our little editing circle where we'll send each other drafts and get feedback because that team is still kind of intact in some way. So I worked with amazing people and I, I really love them very much. They're like my family. Thank you very much for articulating during eight years some wonderful um, moral principles on behalf of the Obamas and that represent the best of the United States. And so thank you very much for doing that. Um, I also wanted to ask you if you could say a little bit about the conversation that took place before the speech where Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we go high. Yeah. So it's funny, you know, that line was hers. She came up with it, she said it, and I thought, yeah, it's a great line. So I just typed it, my only contribution was typing into the speech, literally. <laughs> that was it. Um, but that, that was a speech where she just knew so clearly what she wanted to say. She just knew, like, this speech is gonna be about our children, and she's gonna start with her children, and it, it just, that was the theme of the speech, and how Hillary Clinton is gonna be good for our children. I mean, she just knew it so clearly. So I think the defining characteristic of that process was her, the clarity of her vision. That was really it. And I remember thinking when she said that line, I remember thinking, that is such a nice line. 
didn't think that much more than that. I just said, that's nice. Put it in the speech. I had no idea it was going to become such a big line. I mean, people often come up to me and they say, you know, I say that to my kids when they're dealing with bullies at school or a rabbi I know said, you know, my wife and I were dealing with a difficult situation and we just turned to each other and said, no, 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 when they go low, we go high. And I think I've, I've heard of like teachers using it with their students. I mean, it's really become this kind of wonderful motto and that just, it just came from her. And I think you never know what's really gonna take off. You know, I, I sometimes have some sense of what's gonna catch on and what's not, but in that case, I really didn't know. So it was a wonderful surprise. Sarah, working for all those years with Obama, how, if at all, did that change you, not as a speechwriter, but as a person? Oh, wow, that is a great question. Um, yeah. You know, I think it made me, you know, I think that during the course of my eight years, I saw up close and personal just how unforgiving and unfair politics can be. You know, you kind of see how the person who just sends, hits send on the wrong email, or says the thing into the hot mic, or leaves the binder on the park bench, they do this one thing, they have this one tiny mistake, their email is leaked, and suddenly their life is ruined, right? Suddenly it's like everyone's talking about them and they look like this awful person and they're just, you know, it, it's so, people make these mistakes that I make all the time, that we all make all the time, and they just have these terrible repercussions. So I think, you know, over my, my years in politics, I gained a real compassion and a real sympathy for people who are going through that, and kind of a sense of humility and a sense of just always kind of living on borrowed time where, you know, I could be the one who sends the wrong email. I could be the one whose emails are leaked. I have so, you know, I have so much compassion for the person, the decent person to whom the one bad thing happens. And I think, you know, that is something that was really sobering for me and something that I was just constantly aware of over time. Um, I felt very lucky in my time in politics. Like I just felt like I had my nine lives and I kind of used them up. You know, there were plenty of, I think about that Japanese proverb, like, that would have been a disaster. I mean, I think about the time that I actually, I sent these speeches to the teleprompter. Mrs. Obama was speaking, doing a stump speech in Michigan and then a stump speech in Ohio. And I don't know what happened. I sent them to teleprompter operators in both states, forgot about it. And then for some reason, like a few hours later, I ended up having to reach one of the teleprompter operators and they forwarded me what I had sent them. And I had actually sent the Ohio speech to Michigan and the Michigan speech to Ohio. Really bad. Uh, so, you know, Mrs. Obama would have gotten up there and been thanking a bunch of Ohio politicians in Michigan. You know, it's like, wow, that was a really close call. So I just have a real sense of um, kind of humility and kind of gratitude for, for my good luck. Hi. How do you perceive that your synthetic skills as a speech writer differ or maybe concur with those of rabbi, like Rabbi mm. Harold Loss, who's sitting right over here behind me? <laughs> uh, when he uh, meets on the eve of a wedding or a funeral and then has to give a presentation yeah. uh, shortly thereafter? I think it's actually very, I mean, I think the, the speaking part of it, the, you know, whether you're giving a Bar or you're giving a speech, it's a very similar skill, very similar. In fact, I actually spoke at a rabbinical school to the rabbinical students about the art of speech writing and everything I was saying, they were kind of nodding and saying like, yeah, it is the same art, right? You're trying, a good speech is designed to move people. That's it, it's designed to move people. It's designed to reach their hearts, it's designed to inspire them, to empower them, to educate them, to lift them up. And I think this is what rabbis are doing, right? They're really seeking to move their congregations, to give them spiritual edification, to lift them up, to empower them, to inspire them. I think the skills are basically identical. You know, obviously the speech writing doesn't have all the other responsibilities of rabbis, which are vast and involve basically every skill set known to humankind. You know, I only do one small part of what rabbis do, so I have a lot of respect for, for the work that rabbis do, but it's very, very similar. The fifth, the fifth and final pointer of effective speech giving <laughs> is always leave them wanting more. <laughs> so at that point, we're going to say thank you again to thank Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. For being with us.
to Temple Israel, as always, for partnering, for housing us. A very special thank you to the Michigan Interpreting Group for being here to help make this evening accessible for the community. Thank you all so much for coming. We look forward to having the chance to learn from and with you soon. Take care. Thank you. Awesome.